Can we give Rosa Lee a hand? That was fabulous. She's about to slink down in her chair all the way to the floor. Hey, but that is absolutely fantastic. Like, as a pastor, and I know as her parents, when you see middle and high school students in your church stepping up to do things, even I mean, just like video announcements. I mean, how many of you adults would get behind the camera, right? Uh, but she showed a lot of courage and talent. That was, that was great. So uh, we love to see our, our students, when they uh, graduate out of kids' life, so to speak, begin to serve in the greater ministry of the church, uh, whether that's through things like video announcements or community projects, serving in our audiovisual booth, th- things like that, man. It's just great to see them uh, using their skills and talents to serve the Lord. So uh, proud of you for that, Rosalie. Thank you so much for doing that. It's great. Uh, she mentioned the uh, marriage conference. So I just want to camp out on this for a second because if you were waiting to sign up for the marriage conference, wait no longer, okay? That's next Saturday. Uh, <clears throat> Valentine's Day weekend is creeping up on us really, really fast. So if you want to attend the marriage conference, go ahead online today or through the New Life Church app and get signed up. Again, it's absolutely free from 1 p.m. to 6 p.m., Make sure that you give yourself a little time after the conference, maybe to go out and, and uh, you and your spouse grab dinner together before you go pick the kids back up or whatever you have uh, planned. So it's going to be a great evening for all of us, and I want to emphasize all of us. We would love as many who have the opportunity to come, if your schedule will allow it, to be here. And so with that, let me say this. I know that Sometimes we fall into the false thinking that only people who have marriage problems attend marriage conferences. Okay, can we all be honest with each other here for a second? We all got problems. You know what I'm saying? Even the best of us have marriage problems. There, there is no perfect relationship. There's no perfect marriage. But it doesn't mean that because you attend the marriage conference that you have you know, pressing issues or that your marriage is in crisis. I mean, that's not the case, and that's not the assumption of us here at the church or those who are leading the conference for us. It could be that you are a wise couple, and you see it as a very wise thing to do to invest in your marriage on a regular basis and to just sort of attend something like this by way of a checkup, right? I mean, you wouldn't wait to take your car to the auto mechanic when it's you know, blown up, when the engine's locked up. So don't wait until there's a crisis to get counseling or to go to a conference like this. Do it as a part of regular maintenance. Uh, do it as a way just to, to have something to do together that you both enjoy and that's going to benefit your relationship. So... Uh, take that for what it will, and go ahead and sign up today. Don't, don't wait till the last minute to do so. We'd love to know how many people we have attending. Um, <clears throat> so that to the side now. Um, here we are, you know, first Sunday of the month, which, by the way, is always Discovery Class. You'll notice the banner stands out here, first Sunday of every month. During second service, so if you're interested in Discovery Class, uh, becoming a member of New Life Church, Make sure you put it on your calendar if you didn't do so this month to attend Discovery Class the first Sunday of March. So that's always there. But it also happens to bring us to the end of our first series of the year. And I hope that you have had the privilege of being here every single week, that you haven't missed not one message of this uh, initial series. If you have, then luckily for you, we have those online for you. Uh, our Facebook page, also our YouTube channel uh, has those there. So I would encourage you to go back and watch any of the former messages that you've happened to miss. Catch up with the rest of us. And here's why that is important. I think we have laid a foundation over the first few weeks of this year that will carry us through the rest of the year. It just seems like, and, you know, I'm no, I don't claim to be some prophet or anybody that knows the future or anything like that. Uh, but I just sense a move of God and His Spirit in my own life, and then I generalize that sense to the rest of us in, in this, that I really believe, of course personally, for me, 
but extending to you. I really believe that this year, 2022, is going to be a year of spiritual progress. Now, what do I mean by that? I am convinced that this is going to be a year of spiritual growth for many of us. As we really put in the effort necessary to deepen our faith, to enhance our relationship with the Lord, to improve our relationship with other people, I really believe. It it just, I have that sense that if we do the things that we've already been talking about this year and continue to add to that through the rest of this year, we're creating new patterns and new habits and routines in our lives, new normals, that this is going to be a year where we experience some impressive spiritual progress that many of us are going to make great strides this year in your relationship with the Lord and and with other people. I'm convinced also that if you continue on the pattern, because I've talked with many of you about what you're already doing this year, if you continue in that, at the end of this year, And then for years to come, you're going to look back and say about 2022, that was the year. That was the year that my faith, my relationship with the Lord, my relationship with other believers, it went to a new level, took on a whole new look. It was like the new and improved me started in 2022. And and so this is the beginning. And, of course, as your church, we obviously want to make available to you all kinds of resources and helpful tools so that you can make that kind of spiritual progress. Those are already available, have been for quite some time. But we are going to be adding to that this year and giving you more opportunities to grow in your faith. Just like, uh, you know, for the ladies, you saw Lori's video about the new life group on Saturday mornings at 9. Ladies, that's a great opportunity right there to make spiritual progress, to spend some time with other ladies who want to pray and who want to encourage one another, who want to study the Word and who want to reflect on the messages that we're teaching here. So all of these things and more are coming your way this year. And and I have to sit back and think, man, wouldn't that be incredible? I mean, think about it for a moment. What if we all did that? What if every individual, every couple... Every family in our church made spiritual strides. You know, it doesn't mean that we're comparing one with the other and trying to keep pace with each other. But if everybody made some steps forward, it would radically transform our church. We wouldn't look like the same church at the end of this year as we do right now. And I think we're a great church. But just imagine how much greater, how much better things would be. How much more influence, how much a greater impact we would have in our community and around the world if we all, if we all grew spiritually this year, if we all deepened our, our faith. And, and I know that sometimes we, we think about things like that, and, and then personally we think, is that too good to be true? Like, is that really possible? Well, no, it's certainly not too good to be true. It can happen for you and and in your life and in your family. And we wonder, well, what's the catch? What are you not telling us? Well, there really is no catch, especially if you're thinking along lines of what we've been talking about the last few weeks. We have absolutely destroyed the myth that spiritual progress, a deepening of one's faith, a living a life of fullness and abundance... Is, a, is some kind of secret. It's just not. There is no secret sauce, as we've said it. There, there is not some group of Christians or followers of Christ who have everything figured out or who have certain skills and abilities or inside knowledge that the rest of us don't have privilege to. That is absolutely not the case. As a matter of fact, the opposite is true. And we see that as we begin to read the passage we've been studying over the past five weeks, 2 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 3. This has been our theme verse, memory verse, if you will. I hope it's beginning to take root in your mind and in your heart. It says this, that God's divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. 
through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. So right there you have it. There is no secret. Nothing is being withheld. Nothing is being hidden. It's all out there in the open. Just like ingredients that are laid out on our counter or spices that you might have in your spice rack. Everything that we need to live the life that God desires for us, He's already made available. It says it right there. He has given us everything that we need. Now, if there is a catch, here it is. These ingredients won't put themselves together. They won't just simply uh, and miraculously add themselves to your life. It's going to take effort, isn't it? It's going to take some work. It'll take, well, we hate this word, discipline. Intent, intentionality. Just like great meals, great dishes, desserts. They, all these ingredients don't just jump out of your fridge and out of your uh, cabinets and just throw themselves together and, and out comes this fantastic meal. It doesn't happen that way. You have to put in the work to put these things together. And so a life of, uh, of fullness, a life that's marked by spiritual progress, has to be worked for. And so we see that as we continue to read what Peter wrote here, picking up in verse 4. <coughs> it says, through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, that means you're adding to them, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So it's all there. All the ingredients necessary to live a life of godliness, a life that brings glory to God. Um, when I was in high school and, and there for a few years afterward, I worked at a family-owned pizza restaurant in Albemarle that some of you probably remember and frequented often. Tui's Pizza. How many of you remember Tui's Pizza? If you're not from around this area or you're younger, you don't remember it. But it was fantastic. Like it, was, it was a great place, not only to eat, but a great place to work. Uh, Tui's Pizza was the CC's Pizza before CC's Pizza was a thing around here. Again, family-style environment, big screen TVs, arcades for the kids, buffet-style eating. It was fabulous. And so, I, again, I worked there a few years uh, through my junior, senior year of high school and worked a couple years after I, I graduated. Over that period of time, about four, four and a half years, I worked my way up the very short corporate ladder at Tui's Pizza. I started out just like everybody else, all the other guys, uh, cleaning tables, washing dishes, sweeping and mopping the floors, by the time I left, I had worked myself all the way up to assistant manager. Get this, making a whopping six twenty-five an hour. <laughs> making that bank, you know, chasing the paper. But anyway, I had also grown in, in my knowledge, my understanding of, of the pizza restaurant. That one in particular, I wasn't satisfied with just cleaning tables and sweeping floors. As I worked my way up in responsibility, I learned all of the, uh, you know, the necessary skills, if you would, to run the restaurant. And so by the time I left, there was nothing about that restaurant that I couldn't do. From opening to closing to running the entire service, I knew the ins and outs of that operation. And, uh, and got fairly, you know, skillful at it, I might say. One of the things that I really like to do, a lot of the guys would like to learn to do this because primarily it would get them out of <coughs> cleaning tables and washing dishes for an hour or so. But each night, we had to make the dough that was used for the pizza crust the next day. 
All right, that was something I really enjoyed doing. It was, it was something different, and it got you away from all the hustle and bustle in the restaurant, and you were sort of isolated in the back by yourself doing, doing your own thing there. And I remember, not all the details, but the process of making that pizza dough. I mean, even, even now, there was this little index card, and it had all the ingredients, all of the measurements that you needed, how to put them together and, and mix them up and all of the times that were necessary uh, to produce the right product. Right? If, you, if you used all of these ingredients in the right amount, in the right way, it would produce a pizza dough that was consistent, that, that tasted the same, looked the same every single time. You know, 25, bag, uh, 25 pounds of flour, you throw in you know, a few cups of sugar, some salt, some pepper, different spices like that. You add water. There was obviously a certain amount of water that you had to add into this mixture of ingredients, but that wasn't the only thing. It wasn't just about the amount of water. That water had to be heated to a specific temperature. If I remember correctly, it was 85 and a half degrees. And then you would mix all of that in the large commercial mixer or kneader for a specific amount of time. You would take that dough out you would put it into the bottom of a large plastic, you know, like Rubbermaid type can, 33 gallon, like a big trash can. And you would pack it down in the bottom. You would put a lid on it for the night. The next morning, you would come in and that dough would have risen and filled the entire uh, barrel. Sometimes it would rise so much that it would pretty much push the lid off the top of the barrel. And so then we would dump it out on this large table and we'd start slicing it, weighing it, pressing it out to make pizza crusts. Every now and then, we would come in the next morning ready to slice, weigh, and make pizza crusts and find that the pizza dough was still in the bottom of the barrel. Nothing had happened overnight. It was the same way as it was when it was put in there. So we had a problem. The problem was... Whoever it was that made that dough the night before forgot one very essential ingredient. What would that be? Yeah, absolutely. See, it didn't even work in a pizza restaurant. You know that's necessary. Duh. But it happens. I would do it sometimes and forget one of the most essential ingredients. Without yeast, of course, your dough is not going to rise and you're not going to have very good pizza crusts. It's absolutely critical to the outcome or to the end product. Here's the thing. Most recipes are that way. Whether you're uh, you know, creating your, your grandmother's recipe for you know, biscuits or some casserole or your famous dessert, there's usually one key ingredient that if you forget it, if you don't put that in there, then well, it just doesn't turn out quite right, does it? It doesn't taste the same. Or maybe it just ruins the dish altogether. And what we're going to find today is that this recipe in 2 Peter, the recipe for a full life, is that way. There is an ingredient, in fact there's two ingredients that we're going to combine today, that are absolutely critical. And without it, everything that we've been talking about for the last five weeks, all of the other ingredients are going to be rendered ineffective. So real quick before we get to the final one, let's, let's do a little recap so far. Peter said, add to your faith. In other words, once you have established a relationship with Christ, there are some characteristics, some traits that you need to build into your life. Here are the ingredients. He says, add to your faith goodness. In other words, begin to use your relationship with the Lord to have a good influence, and to bring about good into the world around you. So add to your faith goodness. And to your goodness, knowledge. Increase your knowledge of God, of His Word, your understanding of God, and then use that knowledge in practical and appropriate ways. We call that wisdom, rightly applied knowledge. And then add to your knowledge, self-control. We all need to learn a little more self-restraint. When and how to hold ourselves back and not always just react 
to uh, you know, a situation the way we feel or, or act on the first thought that we have. So to learn some self-control. And then to self-control, add perseverance. That is endurance. Acquire some determination. And to your perseverance, we talked about last week, add godliness. Begin to do the things that would add God-like characteristics into your life. Soak up and saturate yourself in the things of God until it just permeates every part of you and your life. So those are all the ingredients that we've talked about so far. and you've, You may have noticed a couple of things. One of those is that as you go down the list, the difficulty of mastering and you know, living out these characteristics increases from goodness to godliness the difficulty there is is ever increasing as you work your way down down the list there's also something else you should probably notice about this list as you move from godliness to goodness or from goodness to godliness and to what we're going to talk about today uh, you'll notice a shift take place this is natural, and this is, this is totally to be expected. If you're following this process, it's a good thing. But the shift is away from yourself and what benefits you and more towards a focus on God and on what benefits others. All right, so that's the way of Christ, a greater focus on God and others and not so much on ourselves. And so then we come to this final and I would just say most critical ingredient And again, it's actually two that we're going to combine, and that is mutual affection and love. They make this list separately, but I think it's important that we talk about them together because they're so uh, similar. Now, just for understanding purposes, for clarity's sake, let's define these two ingredients separately. First, mutual affection. Now, depending on the translation, the English translation that you use of, of the Bible. I use the NIV when I'm reading and when I'm teaching. You might use ESV or some NLT, some, some translation. What you find is that each one of them uses maybe a slightly different word or phrase for mutual affection. Some call it brotherly kindness. This, the contemporary English version calls it concern for others. It really doesn't matter. They all capture the thought and the meaning of the word that, Paul, or that Peter originally used. The New Testament was written in Greek. And in the Greek language, he used the word Philadelphia. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should, because it's where we get the name of the largest city in, uh, in Pennsylvania called Philadelphia, right? The city of what? Brotherly love. And so when Peter used this particular word, it would have been a word that to his readers described a love between siblings, between brothers and sisters, a familial love. But it would also be applied to describe the love that you and I would have for one another, the love for other brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, a a common Christian love. For one another. So add to your godliness this familial love and affection for one another that's genuine and sincere. And then to that, he used the word for love in the Greek that is the word agape. Agape in the New Testament is most often used in connection with God's love for us, it describes a love that is covenant based. That's promise-based, not conditional. That's why we say the the love of God is unconditional. The love of God is is enduring. So for the Greek reader, when they would have have looked at this passage and he said, add to your mutual affection love, they would have immediately in their minds thought about the highest form of love possible. And for us as Christians, we believe that the highest form of love possible is the love that God has demonstrated toward us by way of coming as one of us, dying on the cross for our sins so that he might reconcile us to himself. 
That is a God-like love. Now, why would I combine mutual affection or brotherly love and this agape or God-like love? And the reason is very simple. When asked, what is the greatest commandment by a teacher of the law, Jesus said this. In Matthew 22, verse 37, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets, in other words, all that God requires and expects of us, hang on these two commandments. So I'm connecting them because it seems to me that Jesus connected them. A God-like love for God and for others. Jesus put those two traits together. Later on in the New Testament, in the writings of the Apostle Paul, he combined, it, he combined those two uh, commandments into one. Now, in the culinary world, you would call that reduction. right? When you sort of boil things down to something very concentrated. And that's what Paul did. He took... Jesus took all these commandments and, and, and reduced it to two. And then Paul took those two commandments and reduced it down to one. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 14, he says, For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we begin to see that, that these two ingredients are virtually inseparable. Mutual affection, a brotherly love, a love for others like God loves them, and a love for God and others that is reflective of His love for us. They, they go hand in hand. One of Jesus' closest disciples, John, he focused on the concept of love, a love for God and a love for others. In 1 John, one of his later letters, before the book of Revelation, you have 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And in 1 John chapter 3 and 4, if you'll read those this week, I would encourage you to mark in some way, underline, highlight, or just draw a heart every time you see the word love. It'll blow your mind how many times he uses that word. But he's trying to send a message here of the importance of you know, connecting our love for God and our love for God. For people, just let me read you a couple of examples. First John chapter 3, verse 11, he says, For this is the message you heard from the beginning. In other words, from the beginning of Jesus' life and ministry all the way up until now, there has been one consistent message. We should love one another. He went on a few verses from that in verse 14 to say, We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Let me clarify that passage for you. John is saying that one surefire way to know that you've been saved is that you love people. If you find it difficult to love people, or you say, I can't love them, guess what? You may not be saved. I'm not trying to pass judgment. I'm not trying to be anyone's judge. I'm simply stating the very word of God who says, listen, if you can't love people, then there's a spiritual, a deeper spiritual problem in your life. It's that important. He would go on to write in 1 John 4, verse 7 and 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. But whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. See that common theme there? I mean, we only read like four verses there. Again, you'd be amazed at how many times John dips into that bag and pulls out the word love in those two, those two chapters. What we take away from it is simply this, that God expects us to love like he loves. Our faith, our, our fullness of life, it all rises like that dough down in the bottom of that barrel. It rises as we love. The more we love, the more our faith, the more our fullness, the more satisfaction in life grows. 
See, without it, all the other ingredients, everything that we've talked about since week one, they're pretty much rendered useless and ineffective. Because this one is absolutely key. And you might remember, if you've ever been to a wedding, you've heard probably 1 Corinthians 13 read before. You might remember that the first three verses, Paul really focuses on the importance of love. How essential it is to life and and our productivity. Let me read those for you. He says, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, we've talked about knowledge, haven't we? And if I have faith that can move mountains, but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I possess, if I give all I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. You see how important it is? Man, we could work really hard to add to our faith goodness, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, all these things. But if we miss love, it's all for nothing. We've wasted our efforts. And now just so that we understand it, you know, unlike the word that we throw around in our culture and our society, when we say we love this and we love that and we love them, this kind of godlike love, a love that's reflective of, of who God is and how he loves, it's a love that chooses to love even when we disagree. It's a love that chooses to love even when we're hurting. It's a love that chooses to love even when we are at odds, when we're not of the same political party, when we don't look the same, when we don't hold the same opinion. I mean, you could just go down the list. It chooses to love anyway. It's a love that we add to our faith, not because we gain something from it, but because it will benefit those around us. That's what makes it so difficult. But that's what makes it also so important. So let me, this morning with the time we have left, give you three characteristics of God-like love. This is what makes this kind of love so incredible, but again, also so difficult. One is that God-like love (coughs) is pricey. If you're a parent or a grandparent sitting in this room, you understand this kind of love. Because loving your children is expensive, isn't it? I mean, we all just came out of uh, the Christmas season. And if your kids are anything like my kids, everything they want is expensive. But they don't fall far from the tree because everything their dad wants is expensive. I love expensive toys, right? We all do in our our own right. Hopefully, we've showed a little self-control, right? little restraint and we're not mounted with debt now at the end of January going into February because we overspent in December if that sidestep here for the sermon if that happens to be the case we have a solution for you (laughs) Friday March the 11th will be the first uh, time well it won't be the first time we've offered it but this year be the first time this year we offer Financial Peace University okay if you need to learn how to get control of your money instead of your money controlling you, sign up for financial peace. If you want to get out of debt and live more financially free, be financial independent, you know, sort of chart a path for the future, sign up for financial peace. It is not free. There is a cost for the material, but it will be well worth your investment to do so. Okay, commercial break over. (laughs) When I think about children and, and my experience of of having two of my own, there's no denying that it's an incredible blessing, right? Again, whether we're talking about children or grandchildren, they are are an incredible blessing, one of the greatest blessings that I think you'll ever experience in your life. And to love children is a thing that, man, it's hard to explain. It's really difficult to put into words that experience of loving your children and how that makes you how that makes you feel 
But one thing that we all understand is that there is definitely a cost to it. I mean, can anybody say diapers? Like, man, thank the Lord that my kids have outgrown those. Baby food, formula, you know, if you go that route. I mean, it's like everything is expensive. It's probably they know that you need it, and like you're not going to go without it, so they just charge you as much as they can for it, and we, and we pay it. But aside from that, there comes doctor visits, um, you know, youth camp, things like that. That's coming up. Cost you 70 bucks for a winter retreat. <laughs> College funds, maybe helping them acquire their first car. There are other costs. There's emotional costs. It'll cost you plenty of sleepless nights when you decide to have children. So uh, there, there are a lot of uh, factors that are associated with children, a lot of sacrifice that's required. But it's all a part of it. You know, that, that's a godlike love. Sacrificial, unconditional, godlike love will always cost us something. The way of following Jesus. Living life the way Jesus lived it and loving the way Jesus loved will always cost you something. It demands a price. In one of his last messages to his disciples in John 15, listen to what Jesus said about the cost. In verse 9, he says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. In other words, love the way I love. Verse 12. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, and here he puts a price on it, to lay down one's life for one's friends. That's pricey, sacrificial, God-like love. It's the love that Jesus modeled. It's a love that, that loved to the very end. Even when it looked as if his own life was going to be taken from you, Uh, from him he said oh wait a minute time out that's not going to happen no one will take my life from me in fact I will willingly lay it down for those whom I love sacrifice pricey love something else we need to keep in mind when we're thinking about adding mutual affection and love to our life is that that God-like love is not only pricey but it's preemptive it's preemptive in other words it, it doesn't wait to be loved it loves first which is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 5 verse 8 when he says God demonstrates his love for us in this while we were still sinners in other words when we didn't love him we weren't even thinking about loving him while we were still sinners Christ died for us he loved first Again, think about that parent-child relationship again because it's so fitting, it's so reflective. Let's just stick with it for a moment. I, I remember vividly how I felt how, and even how conflicted I was when it was, the day was approaching that my children were going to be born. All right, Now, my two girls are three years apart, and I certainly have a, a vivid recollection of how I felt leading up to the birth of my first child, Elan. I'd never been a parent before. I'd never had anyone to call me dad. I didn't know how to love a child. I mean, I'd been a youth pastor. And I knew what, like, Christian love was, brotherly love was. And and I knew how to to show affection toward other people's kids. But I never had any of my own. So I didn't know what this was going to be like. And there was that thought in my mind somewhere that, Am I going to be able to figure this out? How am I going to feel about this little human being in my life? How will I love her? And then, three years later, when Ella comes along, like many parents, when your second child is is approaching, somewhere in your mind you're thinking, am I going to be able to love this one like I love the other one? Right? I mean, I'm hoping I'm not just out there in left field somewhere by myself but I really I thought that how would I love this one like, but you, you all understand that all that comes to nothing it's really nothing to worry about 
I don't know how it happens. I can't really describe it. I don't know how to put it into words. But as soon as I laid eyes on both of them, I loved them. Man, I had a crazy love. And still, too, to this day, I chose that day to love my children sacrificially, unconditionally, before either one of them ever figured out how to show me that they love me, I love them. Before either one of them ever figured out how to put words together to form a sentence to say something like, Daddy, I love you, I love them. And before either one of them ever did anything that made me want to uh, maybe rethink or consider their existence, I love them. Like, I know we joke about it, but you, you parents, you know. You know what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter what your kids do or what they don't do. You certainly want your kids to grow up and to make wise choices and, and to choose the right paths. Sometimes it doesn't quite always work out that way. But you love them anyway, don't you? That's a God-like kind of love. Unconditional, preemptive love. To love them before they can love you. And that's what Peter says God wants us to apply to all of our relationships, not just to our family. I would say, first and foremost, to our family, to our spouse, and to our children. But we need to expand that kind of love to others around us, to include our friends, you know, our distant relatives, our co-workers, those we go to school with, those in our neighborhood, but also those who disagree with us, those who want to seemingly always come into conflict with us, argue with us, give, them, give us their opinions that we didn't ask for, all of those people. He said, love them preemptively before any of them can love you. So why is that? Why would God feel it is so important that we add to our faith this kind of love? And I believe it's because, number three, God-like love is just so powerful. It's powerful. There was a couple, and I won't tell you who they are. <clears throat> it doesn't really matter, but all they seemed that they could do was fight. Maybe you say, well, you just described us. But all, they, every day, day in and day out, anytime they seemed to have a conversation, they, they fought. They argued about everything. And it had come to such a place where in both of their minds, they were convinced that if something didn't change, divorce was likely inevitable. That's where they were headed. And so as a last-ditch effort to get to the root of their issues, they decided they would both take a sheet of paper and they would write down on that sheet of paper all of their complaints, all of their dissatisfaction, everything that they were frustrated about, everything that made them unhappy. They would write them all down and then they would trade sheets of paper. They would give their spouse and, and they would take to heart and really read and think about what each other had written. And so they set a time to do this. They came to, together and, and they both had their, their sheet of paper and their, uh, their pen. And they began to write. And boy, they scribbled as fast as they could and as much as they could. And the more they wrote, the angrier they got. And every once in a while, you know, they would write and they would stop and they'd look at each other. You know, they'd just stare and then they'd go back and they'd write some more. And they would think, and boy, you could just see, you know, just how furious they were with each other. And the wife, she had written so much that she made it all the way down to the very bottom of the sheet of paper. And she slammed her pen down. She was done. But to her surprise, her husband kept writing. He would stop for a minute and he would look at her with this stare that would just stab her through the heart. And he'd write some more. And he got down to the bottom of that sheet of paper. <laughs> and he turned it over and kept writing. She wanted to explode. 
Her jaw clenched. Her fists were balled up. She could have punched him right between the eyes. But at the same time, her heart broke as he continued to spell out his complaints. And after a few minutes, he got to the bottom and he put his pen down. He slid his paper to her. And she received that piece of paper. And she looked at it and immediately she wanted to snatch hers away from him. Because what she read on his sheet of paper over and over and over again it said I love you. I'm so angry right now that I could hardly stand to look at you but I love you. I don't trust you but I love you. I don't know how we're going to get through this. It all seems hopeless. All is lost, but I love you. I'm struggling right now with, with forgiveness. But I love you. And on and on and on it went. That day they realized the power of God-like love. They reconciled restored their relationship, began to practice and extend and express God-like love to one another. It was an incredible transformation. But they realized the power in what is at times very pricey, it's very costly, sacrificial love. They realized the power at in loving the other before the other did anything to be loved for. Preemptive love. It, it, it's, a, it's a kind of love that, that the Bible says in 1 John 4.18 casts out fear. It's a powerful love. A love that 1 Peter 4.8 says covers sin. A multitude of them. It's a kind of love that Colossians 3.14 says creates unity. It brings people together. And as we've seen here in 2 Peter chapter 1, it's a kind of love that completes our faith. Now here's what I want you to take home, not just today, but for this entire series. Don't end up with a flat faith. You know, like that dough that didn't rise in the bottom of the barrel. Don't end up with a flat faith because you forgot to pitch your yeast. Don't go light on love. Go all in. Love like God loves. Peter said, make every effort. In other words, every opportunity you get, add to your faith goodness. And to your goodness, add knowledge. To your knowledge, add self-control and perseverance. Then work on godliness. And lastly, but certainly not least, don't forget to love. Show mutual affection and godlike love to everybody in your life. That is the not-so-secret sauce to a full life. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to say this one last thing. I want you to hear it. I want you to take it home with you. I want you to really uh, give it deep consideration right now. To show this kind of love, you have to know this kind of love. Don't let that slip your attention. To know this love, you have to show this love, you have to know this love. In other words, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, man, this is going to be so foreign and it's going to be impossible. You can't express, you can't show a God-like love without knowing, having experienced God-like love from the source. And so if that happens to be you, what do you do with that? All right, so the recipe began with add to your faith. Well, if you don't have any faith, if you don't have a relationship with Christ, the rest of it doesn't even matter. There's, even, there's no use to read the rest of the recipe. You, you're missing the point. Start with faith. If you don't have a relationship with Christ, that's where you begin today. Would you start that by saying something like this? Dear Lord Jesus, I confess to you that I'm a sinner. 
I agree with your word that says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's me. I've missed the mark. I also agree with your word that says, for the wages or the payment of sin is death. That is, it's eternal separation from you. God, I deserve hell. I don't deserve grace. I don't deserve mercy. I don't deserve forgiveness. But your word says, <coughs> the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. My Lord. Because of what Jesus did for me on the cross, he has paid in full what I owe for sin. And Lord, I accept you, Jesus, as my Savior. I confess you as Lord today. And I believe that your word promises eternal life as a result. Listen, you don't have to say exactly what I just said. All I'm doing is giving you an example, something to follow. But in order to have a relationship with Christ, the Bible says that you must confess your sin and you must, you must confess Him as Lord and Savior. So just do that. If you do, take time today before you leave, fill out a connection card that's located in the pocket in the seat in front of you. That is not a trash can. These are brand new chairs. It doesn't uh, go for your candy wrappers. It's there for a purpose. Connection card. So grab one of those and... Uh, Fill it out for us. Take it to the Connection Central as you leave today. We'd love to know about it and love to come alongside you and encourage you in your faith. For the rest of us, this will be a prime opportunity to run back down through this list of ingredients, these characteristics of a full and faithful life, and just ask, is there anything here that I'm missing? Is there anything, any ingredient that I'm coming up short? From goodness to godliness to love. What is it? And ask the Lord to, to help you add that and increase that in your life. God, we thank you that you've, you've really laid it out very clearly for us. The Christian life, the way to abundance, to a, to a full and satisfying life, and a life that brings you glory and honor. It's no secret. Everything has already been made available, but... There's going to have to be some effort, some work put in to add these things to our life, as your word says, in ever-increasing measure. We can't just do a little bit and then stop and expect everything to work out the way it should. It's a daily process. It's a lifelong journey. So, Lord, we thank you that you've, you've made this available to us. We don't have to wonder about what your expectations are or how to live this life in an effective and productive way. But Lord, we do need to be made aware if we're missing out. If there's something that, that we've not added or that we need to increase, that we need to work on, God, we expect that your Holy Spirit will bring that to our attention. And we submit ourselves to you today and ask you to continue your work on us, in us, and through us. And so, Lord, to you be all the glory and the honor now and forever as we do our best to live our lives in a way that pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.